This is the lecture for Module 6. This is uh, a lecture on Part 5 of Whitehead's Process and Reality. It's the final interpretation. It's the shortest part of this book, but it is the uh, most pregnant, I would say, in terms of uh, the impact that it did, in fact, have, especially on... Um, American uh, liberal theology for the last 60 years or 70 years or so. I'm thinking of Charles Hartshorn and John Cobb, uh, John Cobb Jr. and David Ray Griffin uh, and others who have carried forward Whitehead's theological innovations in a way that has uh, entered into the church life um, of many American Christians in a way that I think is really um, important for the future of Christianity, obviously, but also the future of, um, you know, Christian culture and American theological, uh, rather I should say American religious life. Um, and not just American, but I think for all religious uh, practitioners, I hesitate to say believers, because to center belief as the essence of religion, I think, is mistaken. Um, religious practitioners, not only of Christianity, but of Islam, uh, of Judaism, people who follow a non-religious spiritual path, whether American Buddhists or mystics of whatever sort who don't want anything to do with institutionalized religion um, but want to focus on their own individual spiritual experience and attainment and practice, uh, they also, I think, can, can reconnect with um, an, an understanding of what religion means, what God means, by reading, by studying Whitehead's perspective. So I want to run through the chapters in part five and sort of recap what Whitehead has told us and attempt to provide some measure of uh, interpretation of my own to, to help unpack this a bit. So in the first chapter, Whitehead focuses on the ideal opposites, right? Permanence and flux, eternity and time. These are the ideal opposites. And he starts off by just, you know, telling us he's going to engage with religion and that, unfortunately, uh, the history of philosophy has shown that the chief danger when we undertake speculative philosophy is the danger of narrowness in the selection of evidence. Um, many, especially many modern philosophers, have been very dismissive of the evidence provided by religion, that is, by the history of religious experience. Uh, you know, from Whitehead's point of view, and here he's inheriting William James and the sort of radical empiricist um, pluralism, ontological pluralism, and the pragmatism um, that James and Charles Saunders Peirce and John Dewey were instrumental in articulating, um, Whitehead is inheriting this line of thought where religion is, religious experience is, uh, it's a collection of facts that are part of the evidence that must be included in any endeavor to frame a coherent cosmology, right? Human beings including our consciousness. We're part of nature. We are embedded within and emergent from the evolutionary process of the universe and of the earth. And so when we understand, when we try to understand our own religious experience and our spiritual experience, our mystical intuitions, our moral intuitions, when we try to grapple with the place of these facts, um, Whitehead says it, it, it really requires expanding um, a narrow conception of evidence, especially the narrow conception of modern philosophers who have tended to dismiss religion as uh, a sort of childish 
superstition that must be grown out of. You know, Richard Dawkins' latest book, Outgrowing God, is a is a great example uh, of this modern attitude. Uh, somehow we can replace religion with just enlightenment politics, liberal politics, and uh, science, scientific materialism. And all that this ends up doing is turning religion and science... Um, Sorry, all this ends up doing is turning politics and science into religions, surrogate religions uh, that aren't conscious of themselves as religions, but pretend to be something else, something purely secular. So Whitehead's trying to um, prevent us from, from um, ignoring religion because of this uh, naive attitude, um, triumphant the triumphant, heroic rejection and, and uh, explaining a way of religion. Whitehead says, no, we need to look at religious experience as a fact about the universe uh, that tells us something um, about the nature of this universe. Because human beings are, after all, expressions of this universe. So um, when Whitehead looks at, when he looks for the ultimate ideals that have uh, motivated the human adventure, um, and even before the human being emerged, that the ultimate ideals that have given shape to um, the structures of the universe, like stars and galaxies and cells um, that have emerged before humans, these are achievements of value for Whitehead, right? So what are the ultimate ideals that have guided this evolution? Well, um, Whitehead has tried to tell us a bit about those ideals in terms of his categories, in terms of um, the nature of God, as he has described it uh, so far in the earlier parts of process and reality. But when we get into human consciousness, it seems like there are two ideals in particular that Whitehead thinks we need to pay most attention to. And his pragmatic test for how to determine which ideals these are is, well, he asks, which, which of these ideals have issued in greatness? And, you know, he ends up settling on permanence or eternity and the flux, the flow, becoming. He thinks that these are the two ultimate ideals in terms of which all of reality and all of experience, because they're not separate for Whitehead, um, all of experiential reality can be understood in terms of a contrast between these two ultimate ideals. And it's achieving that contrast um, that really is the, it's the poetic purpose of this final part of process and reality. Whitehead wants to um, help us come to see how these ideal opposites hang together. How is it that there is in the inescapable flux, something that abides? And how is it that in the overwhelming permanence, there is an element that escapes into flux? Right? These are Whitehead's words. How is it that these things are held together? Um, Whitehead's vision of the divine, his, his theology, his understanding of God, is his attempt to hold these ideal opposites in unity, uh, to harmonize them, in some way. So Whitehead wants us to take religion seriously, and he says that there is greatness in the lives of those who build up religious systems. But on the other hand, uh, he is not the sort of metaphysician who's constantly trying to pay metaphysical compliments um, and to make metaphysical exceptions for God. Uh, Whitehead thinks that metaphysics needs to uh, correct the excesses caused by uh, religious emotion so that we can bring those religious emotions back into alignment with uh, rat rational thought and intellectual feeling. Um, you know, he's not dismissing emotion by any means, but he thinks that certain religious emotions, for example, have led to this image of God as some sort of uh, cosmic dictator um, or imperial ruler, right? He, Whitehead thinks it's a mistake that the, uh, ju ju that the Judaic, um, the Islamic, and the Christian uh, religions have made by imagining God in the image of Caesar or in the image of a caliph or 
uh, King. This is, Whitehead thinks, one of the most destructive and violence-producing doctrines um, that human beings have ever imagined. So he's critical of religion, right? There's greatness in the lives of those who build up religious systems, and Whitehead adds, there is greatness in the rebels who destroy such systems. And so uh, Whitehead is certainly saying, let's take religion seriously, but he is also extremely rebellious in his criticisms of orthodox understanding understandings of God. Um, God as divine dictator. This sort of God has no place in Whitehead's cosmology. So um, we'll get more into God in a second, but we're still in the chapter on the ideal opposite. So Whitehead thinks that we need to find a way to harmonize these two ideal opposites because he thinks that the perfect realization implants timelessness on what in its essence is passing, he says. So he thinks that time can shift in this perfect realization from uh, perpetual perishing to what after Plato, Whitehead describes as a moving image of eternity. This phrase, moving image of eternity, is from Plato's Timaeus, which Whitehead thinks alongside of Newton's um, scolium is one of the two most important cosmological documents uh, in the history of at least European thought. The Timaeus is Plato's creation story and his understanding of the emergence of human beings out of what is a kind of proto-evolutionary cosmology. Not explicitly explicitly evolutionary, but it is as Plato describes it, a process whereby out of chaos gradually emerges order and there is participation in, in ideal forms in, in Plato's cosmos. There is a demiurge, a world soul, uh, in, and a world soul in Plato's cosmos. Whitehead is drawing a lot on Plato, but he's reforming a lot of these ideas. Um, Whitehead does not want to inherit the Platonic... Um, preference for ideal forms over the passage of concrete fact, you know, for Whitehead, um, actual fact, um, concrete passage is, that's where all the action is. That's where all the value is realized, right? So he doesn't think that the ideal forms have preeminent reality or that God has preeminent reality. What has preeminent reality uh, is the realization of value in the temporal passage of fact. But Whitehead will tell us, of course, in order for value to be realized in the temporal passage of fact, it must partake in eternal forms and eternal objects, and it must partake in God. But the whole point here is that Whitehead's trying to hold these, you know, another way of describing the ideal opposites instead of permanence and flux is God and the world. Whitehead wants us to hold these two together. He's a panentheist. He's not equating the two like a pantheist would. He's not saying God is the world or the world is God. He's saying something slightly more complex, slightly more differentiated than that. It's non-dual, but it is definitely differentiated. He wants to distinguish between these opposites at the same time that he allows us to perceive the harmony uh, that each of them can be can, can achieve. You know, it's like these are notes. Hear the chord. That's what he's asking us to do. So Whitehead will point out, um, still in chapter one now on the ideal opposites, that he'll say order. Order is both a condition of excellence and order can stifle the freshness that is essential for life. Um, so in the, in the case of a human institution, say, as a form of social order, uh, Whitehead says that institutions are both blessings and curses because as soon as an institution achieves dominance, as soon as it has fully settled into its role in a given society, that institution immediately begins to strangle human creativity. So what we need, Whitehead thinks, is a complex balance of order and novelty. Um, and in this context, he points back to his understanding of the role of the human body 
uh, he says, quote, It is by reason of the body, with its miracle of order, that the treasures of the past environment are poured into the living occasion. Uh, so, you know, again, remember, Whitehead thinks the body is this complex amplifier. It has evolved to channel uh, and canalize uh, and filter all the emotion and the feeling streaming in from uh, the physical world around us. It channels all of that. It filters and amplifies it. And it, you know, through a whole historical route of actual occasions of experience of various grades, channeling all of that energy and emotion to what Whitehead will call um, a dominant occasion, which in the case of the human body, he thinks is, he thinks the final percipient the final percipient root of occasions of experience is, he says, wandering in the empty space of the brain. Um, you'll remember from earlier chapters that Whitehead doesn't think that this final percipient occasion, you know, the, 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 the me that we think we are, the I that I think I am in each moment of my consciousness, um, in Whitehead's terms, is the final percipient root of occasions it's wandering in empty space because for Whitehead, it's a non-social uh, nexus. It's not dominated by its environment. It's, you know, the brain creates an environment to support this final percipient occasion, um, to support its novelty, to support its ingression of possibility that is richer than the possibility that can be ingressed by any other actual occasion, uh, at least as far as we can tell. Um, you know, all the other actual occasions in our body serve the purpose of protecting a space of possibility for this final percipient occasion to do things like exercise our freedom of will and our freedom of thought and our creative imagination. Uh, so Whitehead says, all of that creativity, right, that is housed and sheltered in the interstices of our brain, uh, is made possible by the body right, with its miracle of order. So this is what Whitehead means when he says that order provides the foundation um, or the condition for excellence. And yet, um, unless evolution can continue and that order can continue to unfold, then eventually the life that it supports will be squelched. Whitehead tells us that a paradox haunts higher grade occasions of experience like human beings. He says that we crave for novelty, but we're also terrified of losing the past, of forgetting. So we have these vague physical feelings, right? The insistence of causality, of causal efficacy. And we have these intellectual feelings of ideal alternatives to those physical feelings. And it's these ideal alternatives that, uh, for Whitehead, allow human beings to imagine a universe in which there is, as he puts it, no more shipwreck. And this intuition of a universe without shipwreck is what Whitehead defines as the religious problem, right? And an another way of saying it is that the religious problem is this question of whether or not temporal processes of, of the physical world pass into an order wherein novelty does not mean loss, right? The religious problem is do temporal processes of the physical world pass into an order where novelty does not mean loss? Because for Whitehead, the ultimate evil in this universe is that the past fades, right? Whitehead thinks it's an empirical fact that process entails loss. But, you know, we just, we, we all struggle with this, right? People die. Uh, we forget uh, something more trivial. <laughs> we forget the word we want to use. Uh, you know, we, we, we read a book like Whitehead's Process in Reality and still, uh, you know, can barely remember what one of these new words means. Uh, we have finite capacities of cognition, right? It's really frustrating. Uh, it's tragic that people die. Loved ones are lost before their time sometimes. 
for, for Whitehead, this is the ultimate evil of our universe. It's an empirical fact. But, he says, there is no metaphysical reason that this, that this should be the whole story. So this gets us into chapter two, God and the world. Uh, Whitehead describes God as the ultimate conceptual appetition, right? God is the perfect realization of the most ideal possibility, right? Of the most beautiful potential. But God, in this sense, is deficient in actuality, Whitehead says. God, in this sense, is merely God's primordial pole. And without the world, without physical realization, this primordial pole of God remains unconscious. It needs to enter into the multitude of physical facts in order to achieve consciousness. God does not become conscious without participating in the suffering of the physical world. That's Whitehead's vision. Um, now, some religions, Whitehead says, uh, view the physical universe as what he says is a self-sufficient completion of the creative act uh, on page 342. And what does he mean by that? Well, he means that the universe can be explained purely in terms of um, what it is in its current moment of existence, right? This is a materialistic idea, ultimately. Um, you know, there's, there's a deep sense in which scientific materialism, with, with its idea of eternal laws imposed upon passive matter that just obey those laws blindly, passive matter that just follows the law uh, indefinitely, this is a very theological idea, right? Scientific materialism, and Whitehead points this out in his book Science and the Modern World in the early chapter on the history of science, that without Christian theology and the idea of an, of an utterly transcendent God uh, that stamps a law or an order uh, upon a passive material cosmos, you don't get science, right, as the modern thinkers imagined it. This view of the universe as law-abiding and the view of the human being as created in the image of God so as to be able to understand this law, which it turns out is mathematical, this is a very theological idea, right? And Whitehead is not only undermining that theological vision, but he's, he's undermining the scientific materialism, the metaphysics of scientific materialism that is derived from it. So his uh, organic philosophy of nature must come with an alternative organic conception of God. Um, so he doesn't view the universe as a self-sufficient completion of the creative act. The universe isn't done being created, for Whitehead, even God isn't done being created. God is a creature, right? How's that for heresy? Uh, God and the world are both subject to the ultimate principle, which for Whitehead is creativity. God is as subject, we are as subject to creativity as God is, and which is to say we are as subject to the passage of nature as God is. And yet there's something about God that is unique for Whitehead, and that is in some way or another, God is able to uh, save the past, to prevent the past from fading. And Whitehead is really trying to explain how this, how this works. And it's hard, right? It's hard to grasp the vision because it's not purely logical. It's not an argument. Whitehead's not making an argument, uh, trying to prove God, this isn't another, you know, ontological proof of God's existence or cosmological proof. This isn't a proof, right? This is speculative philosophy. It's a hypothesis. Whitehead's laying out, right? He's laid out his categorical scheme. He's exemplified it and applied it in physics and biology and daily life, religious experience. And now he's trying to put it all together to tell us what it means um, to take a high altitude view of the cosmological scheme he's just invented and say this is, this is the God that holds it all together. But he's, he's really asking us to take an imaginative leap here, right? So 
The universe is in a process of creation. It's ongoing, and so is God. God is an ongoing process of creation. That is, nonetheless, everlasting. Uh, God's nature is fully present and immediate, right? It's not like, in some sense, God isn't fully present yet, but will one day become fully present. At the same time that God is caught up in a process of becoming with us, finite with we finite creatures in this temporal world, God is also fully present to each moment of that temporal passage, right? So Whitehead goes through these different ways that God has been imagined in the past. There was Aristotle's unmoved mover. Um, there was the Christian idea of, um, you know, a transcendent creator at whose fiat the world came into being, right? And whose imposed will it obeys. Uh, it's this notion of God made in the image of an imperial ruler, right? Or perhaps in the image of moral energy, right? And Aristotle's more philosophical principle of the unmoved mover. These are the, the options that Western theology, European theology has come up with. And Whitehead's not happy with any of them. And he says, you know, David Hume in his book, um, The uh, Dialogue Concerning Natural Religion, Whitehead thinks that he criticized these three images unanswerably, right, as explanations for the world. They don't do it. Um, Whitehead thinks there's a fourth voice, though, that should have been included. Another speaker should be added to Hume's dialogue. Um, and Whitehead is offering to to play this role for us. He wants to emphasize a different kind of God. And he thinks that the um, the story of Jesus, the person of Jesus, it provides us with a unique approach. Uh, for, for Whitehead, this uh, image of God, it's a God that, he says, dwells upon tender elements in the world, right? And a God which slowly and in quietness operates by love, right? It's not a coercive God wielding the thunder. It's a persuasive God, a patient God. Uh, Whitehead thinks that this is the future of theology, right? Not these old images of, of God as an imperial ruler or a distant unmoved mover. So let's see how Whitehead describes uh, God in terms of these two poles, uh, the primordial and the consequent poles of God. Um, he says that as primordial, God is the unlimited conceptual realization of the absolute wealth of potentiality. And as such, Whitehead says, God is not before, but with all creation. But he says this primordial nature of God is deficient in actuality because its feelings are merely conceptual. Uh, and as such, they are devoid of consciousness. Whitehead says that this primordial pole of God provides order. Uh, it, it provides a relevant uh, ordering of the eternal objects, such that in the process of creation, in each concrescence, the realm of potentials, the infinite realm of potentials or eternal objects, uh, ingresses as it is relevant to that particular concrescence, to that particular actual occasions perspective because Whitehead thinks if each actual occasion um, had access to a sort of unmediated potential that uh, it wouldn't know where to begin it would be overwhelmed and there would be no ideal interpretation at least to initiate that actual occasions um, you know new perspective on the universe right every member every remember that each actual occasion of experience uh, arises out of the past, which is a multiplicity uh, of initial data uh, that it needs to be brought into some sort of a semblance of, of unity initially, into an objective datum, right? And Whitehead thinks that each occasion needs the help of this conceptual realization coming in from the primordial nature of God in order to even begin to interpret the welter of, of data that stream into it in each moment. 
So God provides relevance in, through an initial aim gifted to each finite creature. Uh, this primordial pull of God, Whitehead says, it's a free creative act. It's unfettered by any particular course of events, right? Since all particulars, all finite occasions presuppose it, right? God merely presupposes the general metaphysical character of creativity. Uh, God doesn't presuppose the experience of any other actual occasion of experience, but all other actual occasions presuppose God's experience, God's conceptual realization. So God's primordial nature both exemplifies and establishes the categorical conditions that Whitehead has been describing to us in process and reality. God as primordial is God as a lure for feeling, God as an eternal urge. And, you know, there is a sense, Whitehead admits, in which the primordial pole of God is kind of like Aristotle's unmoved mover. Um, but again, it's not, uh, it's not in the past of all occasions, but in unison of becoming with them. But, Whitehead says, there is another side to God, right? God is not just primordial. God is not just an unmoved mover. Uh, Whitehead says, by reason of the relativity of all things, there is a reaction of the world on God. God's nature is thus completed by physically feeling the world, right? God requires the world. There needs to be an objectification of the world in God. Right? which is to say that God needs to feel the world. God's not just the impassive creator. God is also uh, passive. God feels what happens and needs to somehow take up what happens, all the shipwreck, all the tragedy, take it up into its divine nature and make goodness out of it. Right? How is that possible? That's what... That's, the, the task of explanation that Whitehead is setting himself here. So Whitehead says that God shares every new creature's actual world um, and that every creature, as it is realized, adds novel feelings to God's consequent nature. Uh, God's prehension of each creature is directed by uh, the subjective aim and clothed with the subjective form of God's primordial nature. So uh, God's primordial nature remains unchanged, right? It is unmoved. Um, but as each new finite occasion emerges, uh, God's consequent nature must receive these. Um, but because each of these occasions is already initially guided by God's primordial nature um, and clothed with the sort of emotional value that God's primordial nature carries. Um, it's not as difficult for the consequent nature to, to harmonize with what, phys with what happens in the physical world, right? So the physical world is not determined by God, by God's initial uh, aim, but it is tilted towards that aim, right? So in a way, Whitehead's rigging the deck a little bit here, but he's, you know, he's doing metaphysics, he's asking us He's not asking us to accept that there are no miracles, right? He says, philosophy begins in wonder and at the end, right? In the final interpretation, when philosophy has done its best, the wonder remains, right? So Whitehead's not asking us to accept a proof of the existence of God. He's painting a picture for us and saying, does this feel true? Does it ring true to you? Does it pass the pragmatic test? in the sense that it issues in greatness. So now while Whitehead wants God to exemplify all of the, um, you know, categorical obligations um, and to exemplify the process of concrescence that he has been describing as it uh, unfolds for all the other actual occasions of experience that compose the creative advance of nature, God must abide by the same metaphysical rules that hold everywhere else. And yet, Whitehead makes one uh, shift with God, which is that God's experience occurs in the reverse order. 
uh, to every other actual occasion. For God, um, God's experience originates in conceptual feelings uh, and then seeks completion in physical feelings, right? Which are initially derived from the world. On the other hand, finite occasions of experience originate in physical feelings and they seek completion uh, in conceptual feelings that are initially derived from God, right? So there's a symmetry here, but there's an inversion, right? In the nature of God's experience in comparison to finite occasions of experience. Whitehead says that God feels the creative advance in a unison of immediacy, right? So the divine subjective aim feels each occasion for what it can be in the perfected system. And it weaves each of these occasions into harmony uh, with what Whitehead calls a universal feeling. And in this universal feeling, uh, which is God's consequent nature, right, um, any individual revolts of destructive evil uh, are diminished, right, as just purely and merely self-regarding particular facts. Um, but they're not just erased. These individual revolts, these evil acts are, in the consequent nature, taken up uh, in the sense that they achieve some good, because every act achieves at least some good, even if it's just by heightening contrast. So the, cons the consequent nature preserves even these evil acts, at least in the sense in which they contributed to a more intense experience later. Uh, the, this operative growth of God, Whitehead says, can be imagined um, as a tender care that nothing be lost. Whitehead says that God's consequent nature is God's judgment of the world and that God saves the world as it passes into uh, the immediacy of this divine everlasting life. This is God's infinite patience uh, for the world. And it's through this infinite patience, um, through this love, this divine love and divine wisdom that the temporal world is transformed uh, from mere wreckage uh, into beauty, even if tragic beauty, nonetheless beauty. So Whitehead, at this point, uh, on, I think we're at page 347 or so, Whitehead says that the universe can be understood in terms of a threefold creative act. Now, what's interesting is that a few pages later, he'll say the universe can be understood in terms of a four-phase creative act. Um, but he, right before he gives us the four phases, he says we need a higher understanding here to grasp this fourth element, this fourth phase. But right now, he wants us to just take in the three phases. Um, this is the way that Whitehead's philosophizing here, right? He's uh, developing his thought as he goes. And so we, frustrating as it may be sometimes, um, we can't just stick with what he said earlier in the book. We have to frame what he says earlier in the book with what he says on the last page of the book and understand it all in context as a narrative that's been unfolding. And there's character development, right? In the sense that uh, we get a deeper sense of who each of these categories are um, as their biography unfolds through the pages of process and reality, right? Um, so there's three phases of the creative act now. There'll be four later. We'll get to that. But right now, the first creative phase is the one infinite conceptual realization of God's primordial nature, right? The second phase is the multiple solidarity of free physical realizations in the temporal world. And the third phase is the ultimate unity of the multiplicity of actual fact, right? With the primordial conceptual fact. So this is God's consequent nature. These, this is the threefold creative act, right? Now, Later, Whitehead will give us the four creative phases of the universe on page 350, and he'll describe the first as the phase of conceptual origination, right? That's the primordial pole of God. The second is 
uh, a phase of physical origination, right? That's the multiple real physical realization of finite actual occasions. The third phase is the perfected actuality, where the physical world is taken up into the consequent nature and harmonized with God's conceptual uh, nature. But then there's this fourth phase that Whitehead introduces right at the end of this chapter. Uh, he refers to it as the kingdom of heaven as it passes back into the temporal world. In other words, it's God's response to uh, the phase of physical origination, feeding back into that phase, the physical phase, um, through really all that it can only be described as love. It's God's love for the world. It is, in Whitehead's terms, this fourth phase is God as the great companion, God is the fellow sufferer who understands. So this is the fourth phase that requires, Whitehead says, a, a higher understanding. Um, he says another phase in the nature of things, this role of the kingdom of heaven flowing back into the physical world as divine love. He says it requires an enlargement of our understanding. Um, and so it really does require an imaginative leap here. Whitehead says that God's role is not the combat of productive force, right? Uh, which unfolds in the temporal world. God's role is to be patient, right? God's role is the patient operation of the overpowering rationality uh, of conceptual harmonization. Whitehead says God is the poet of the world, right? Leading it, guiding it, goading it with, with his his, I say, with God, uh, with God's uh, vision of truth, beauty, and goodness. And Whitehead thinks that philosophies that separate the fluent physical world from a static God uh, always end up making uh, prominent use of some concept of illusion. They'll say that all is Maya, right, and only Brahman is real. Um, Whitehead wants to avoid this. He wants illusion uh, not to play such a prominent role in his ontology. He wants God to be so common uh, and so obvious in every moment of our experience that we miss it. So the mystery of God uh, is a function of the obviousness of God, right? This is God's initial aim. It's the divine harmony present in all things. If only we had the eyes to see and the ears to hear um, you know, as Blake, William Blake poetically said, energy is eternal delight. And anyone who gets to know uh, the sun in its, in its full concreteness would come to experience the way that energy is eternal delight, right? It's an everyday experience in that sense. So when Whitehead refers to religious experience, he's He's not just talking about these rare occasions where, you know, we penetrate into uh, the mind of the Godhead um, and feel sort of lifted out of our bodies. It's, I think, a far more common experience um, of just the feeling of the warmth of the sun on your face. If you can't find God's love in that, you're not going to find it anywhere else. So this is a very naturalistic religion. So for Whitehead, God is completed by the individual fluent satisfactions of finite facts, just as, uh, on the other hand, temporal occasions are completed by their everlasting union with their transformed selves, purged into confirmation with the eternal order, which is the final absolute wisdom. So God completes the finite occasions of the world, and the finite occasions of the world are completed by their participation in God. God and the world require one another in this sense. They are mutually sensitive to one another in this sense. God and the world are contrasted opposites, Whitehead says, in terms of which creativity achieves its great task of transforming disjointed multiplicity with its diversities in opposition into concrescent unity with its diversities in contrast. Right? So it's a movement from opposition to contrast. It doesn't eliminate multiplicity. It just brings the multiplicity into harmonization. Just like notes can be harmonized uh, 
into the form of a chord, right? Whitehead tells us that um, both God and the world are in the grip of creativity, as I was saying earlier. Neither can reach a final completion since they are always in this um, disturbed by a principle of unrest. Uh, and yet God provides sufficient permanence to give passage, the passage of finite fact, some eternal value. So Whitehead tells us that each actual occasion of experience in its own individual self-attainment, uh, that it enjoys an immediate overpowering sense of worth beyond itself, right? So in other words, each actual occasion of our experience, it has its present life, and its immediate passage into novelty. But this passage, this passage beyond ourselves, is not death. Uh, we intuit that we can have an effect on the future, and that in that sense, the decisions we make now uh, are open to that future, and that we live on. We gain some sort of immortality um, into the future through our creative acts in the present. And the Whitehead thinks we have a real feeling of the future, an intuition of the future. This is why morality and freedom uh, are possible. And Whitehead says that it is through this feeling, our overpowering sense of worth beyond ourselves, that there is a sense of redemption through suffering that haunts the world. Whitehead gives us an example of what the nature of God is like, the way that the consequent nature of God is growing uh, as it feels the becoming of the physical world. Um, he analogizes God's growth to the life hi history of an individual human soul. Um, you know, each moment of our lives, of our biography, is in some peculiar way... Um, summing up the whole root, the whole root of occasions of our life history, right? Um, so in other words, my experience now and in, in my recollection of who I am, uh, I'm carrying and recapitulating in some sense my entire childhood, um, you know, my adolescence, my, my, the events of my life, right? They're all present, even if not in you know, my immediate consciousness. They're carried forward, and I feel as though I have access to them. That's my, where my sense of identity comes from in each moment. So in the same way that in each occasion of our experience, we're summing up the historical root of occasions, of, of who we are, God is able to maintain a sense of identity even as there's a process of growth unfolding. So to finish off this lecture, I just want to read the final two paragraphs of part five of Process and Reality, the final two paragraphs of the book. Whitehead tells us about this fourth creative phase in which the universe accomplishes its actuality. He says uh, that first there is the phase of conceptual origination, deficient in actuality, but infinite in its adjustment of valuation. Secondly, there is the temporal phase of physical origination with its multiplicity of actualities. In this phase, full actuality is attained, but there is deficiency in the solidarity of individuals with each other. This phase derives its determinate conditions from the first phase. Thirdly, there is the phase of perfected actuality in which the many are one everlastingly without the qualification of any loss, either of individual identity or of completeness of unity. In everlastingness, immediacy is reconciled with objective immortality. This phase derives the conditions of its being from the two antecedent phases. In the fourth phase, the creative action completes itself, for the perfected actuality passes back into the temporal world and qualifies this world so that each temporal actuality includes it as an immediate fact of relevant experience, for the kingdom of heaven is with us today. The action of the fourth phase is the love of God for the world. It is the particular providence 
for particular occasions. What is done in the world is transformed into a reality in heaven, and the reality in heaven passes back into the world. By reason of this reciprocal relation, the love in the world passes into the love in heaven and floods back again into the world. In this sense, God is the great companion, the fellow sufferer who understands. We find here the final application of the doctrine of objective immortality. Throughout the perishing occasions in the life of each temporal creature, the inward source of distaste or of refreshment, the judge arising out of the very nature of things, redeemer or goddess of mischief, is the transformation of itself, everlasting in the being of God. In this way, the insistent craving is justified, the insistent craving that zest for existence be refreshed by the ever-present, unfading importance of our immediate actions, which perish and yet live forevermore.